There we go. All right, so welcome everybody. Today we are going to be reviewing the progress uh, made in sprints 60 and 61. We do have the team slides to kick us off. Um, we've got 14 teams now and a new one coming, a 15th coming. Um, the 15th team is Concord and um, they've given themselves a name. The team has been all hired up. Um, and, um, but they are right now distributed across other teams um, for a couple of sprints. So some I believe are on fully jet and others are on core functional. Um, we'll see you know, who is where in the coming slides. Um, for, in terms of focus, um, we will be looking at the, um, the rankings and the UX prod features to determine what makes sense for them um, for ramp up uh, features. Um, we have identi identified a couple of features that look um, really high priority because they're needed by every single early implementer. So the POs are working on getting a backlog together for Concord. Um, so we plan to have that, that backlog together um, in advance of sprint 64, which is um, when they do plan to form um, and begin working against the Concord backlog. So for the next couple of sprints, they will be um, on other teams. So for core platform, uh, no team changes this period. For core functional, you can see that we do have the two new developers here in the lower left. Um, Vladimir and Dimitro, and um, these are the two Concord developers who are helping out with core functional for the next couple sprints. On the Stripes Force team, we also have a new developer, Ryan Berger, who is um, from EBSCO. No changes on UNAM or at Cult or EBSCO. We do have a couple of new developers for Thunderjet. Um, Andre and Mikita are, have joined the Thunderjet team. Uh, ERM, I didn't see anyone new on this slide. Um, data platform team is the same. Uh, oh, and here we go with FullyJet. Um, Anatoly Starkov um, has joined FullyJet, um, as has Taras. And then Victor and Sergi are um, developers who will eventually uh, join Concord. And no one new on Spitfire. And Vega is the same. And here you can see all of the developers who will be forming the Concord team in Sprint uh, 64. So welcome to all the new people. Uh, no changes to the UX designer team and um, Q2 2019. So normally Jakob would present this slide, but he is still on vacation. So um, I wanted to give a quick overview of what I know so far. Um, so we did start the Q2 2019 release um, development period on April 8th, and we are planning an interim release. So um, we're calling it Q2.1 and it's scheduled for May 17th. And um, we've got feature freeze two weeks before on May 3rd, and then the release deadline for our, all modules is gonna be on May 10th. So it's just one week. Um, you know, the release deadline is just one week before the release and feature freeze just one week before that. Um, so it's, we're getting more efficient with our releases and um, the, the period of time needed is um, is decreasing. So that's that's really positive. I think Jakob feels really confident um, that we'll be able to do this. And um, we may in future releases have even more interim releases. So we decided to start with just one for Q2, um, but maybe we'll have monthly um, interim releases in, in future quarters. Um, in terms of the Q2 release, um, the big release, that's uh, July 1st. And I'm not sure um, what the feature freeze and release deadlines are going to be for that. It may be the same, sort of T minus one and T minus two, but um, I wanna confirm with Jakob. So hopefully he can give us an update in the next review. 
Um, we are currently targeting 95 functional features for the Q2 2019 release. And you can see um, the dashboard with all of the feature breakdown by team and so on um, by clicking this link. I'm not going to talk to the definition of done slide because nothing has changed since last time. Each team has um, created a slide with the highlights from the past couple of sprints. Much of this you will be seeing in the sprint reviews, or sorry, in the sprint demos, but um, some of it you won't. So we wanted to make sure that there was an um, overview of all of the work that was accomplished. And that brings us to the demos. So we've got demos planned um, from Thunderjet on acquisitions. A fully Jet will be presenting Vega at Cult, the ERM subgroup, core functional, and then we'll get a QA update from Anton. And with that, I will turn it over to, it uh, looks like Dennis is uh, kicking us off with Thunderjet. Thanks, Kate. Just a brief introduction to what we're going to show this morning. Um, there are sort of three major components to it. The first is going to be the first demonstration of our organizations module, which is previously or yeah, once known as vendors. Um, it's come up that obviously institutions will need to keep track of organizations that may not actually be vendors. They may provide some other functionality to the system. And so the last couple of sprints have been partially about making this pivot. And we want to show where we are now with the, the organizations app, which of course will mean um, that the vendor app will be deprecated. It still exists in some of the testing environments, but it will not moving forward. Um, so we're going to show organizations a little of that functionality and how it's, how it's uh, taking the place of what we originally considered vendors, um, and we're not losing any functionality there. The second piece is check-in, uh, or serials check-in. So we're going to demonstrate a little of the functionality around uh, checking in pieces. And the last part of that is the interaction between check-in and uh, inventory. And so we'll show how you can actually create inventory items corresponding to things that you're checking in as you're checking them in. Uh, and with that, I'll pass the torch and we'll get started. Okay, hi guys. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let me know if you see it. Looks good. Yeah, okay. As uh, Dennis already mentioned, uh, our team created new model organizations and uh, we deprecated a uh, vendor model, but uh, it's still available on uh, on UI side. Uh, so as for organizations, uh, we support all CRUD operations like create, read, update and uh, remove. So uh, on the base view, we have a list of all uh, organizations with support uh, of uh, sorting, uh, search, and uh, filtering. Um, by clicking on organization item, uh, details pane is open where a user can review uh, all information uh, that related to selected organization. Uh, by clicking on new button, uh, form is opened where, from where user can create new organization. And here we support uh, two types, vendor and non-vendor. So by default, uh, it's not vendor organization. And uh, uh, for uh, and user can fill only summary, contact information, contact people, and interface. And uh, to create a vendor organization, uh, user should click uh, vendor checkbox. So after that, uh, four additional accordions are appeared uh, to fill a vendor specific info like payment method, currency, and so on. Uh, for example, let's create a non vendor.
and uh, save it. So you see uh, vendor has been created, uh, plus uh, details view is opened. Uh, this uh, for accordions related only for uh, non-vendor uh, organization. And uh, we can edit it. Uh, and let's make it vendor. Uh, and uh, for example, set up payment method and update it. So after edit, you can see that uh, additional uh, guardians are appeared, uh, vendor information, vendor terms, ED information, and uh, accounts. Uh, plus, uh, user can remove uh, created uh, organization. So uh, organization has been disappeared from this view. Uh, plus we updated uh, settings uh, page and uh, put uh, additional link for our model, module organizations uh, where user can uh, set up uh, and manage vendor categories. Uh, so it's possible to edit, uh, create and uh, remove category. Um, it looks like the it with organizations. Uh, probably you have questions. I guess there are no questions. I will point out since you're showing this page right here that we do have in settings now we have organization and organizations and that's because um, we had an organization section in settings before. That's where you'll find location setup, service setup, service point setup, locale um, selection, and so on. And we'll be renaming that. So that's um, the work to rename organization um, to tenant, I think was what we selected, um, is underway. Uh, both core platform and core functional are working through that. Yeah. So, Any other questions for Makita or comments? Okay. Um, who was next for you guys? I believe it's Alexi. Alexi. Yeah, I think it's me. Hi, guys. Uh, I hope you see my screen. We do. Nice. Uh, so I'm going to present you check-in uh, function. Uh, it's from orders application. Uh, let's go to snapshot uh, server um, and uh, orders app. Uh, earlier we have shown the um, receiving functionality, but uh, also uh, if user wants some uh, purchase order lines uh, to be checked in, he can specify it uh, in the purchase order line. Uh, Chicken items, it's a checkbox, and uh, we will provide uh, him such uh, functionality. So uh, we have opened order uh, and uh, several uh, purchase order lines assigned to uh, it. Uh, first of the, uh, it has order format physical resource and uh, quantity is uh, two. Uh, so it has its own title. Uh, it's a connection to inventory. Uh, and uh, some uh, another uh, create inventory uh, option, instance holding item. It uh, shows us uh, that user can specify, uh, can create item uh, while check in. Uh, so let's uh, do this. We have uh, actually location specified uh, here uh, for one quantity, it's one location and uh, for another, it's uh, another. Mm. So let's go to check in for this uh, purchase order line. Uh, and the user can add pieces. Um, 
let's uh, specify some caption, uh, location, and the user can left some comment. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, he can just save it or check in. Uh, let's save it and uh, we'll stay in the list of check-in items. Uh, we can add another item uh, for the different location. Uh, and we can uh, actually press add item button with uh, form, create item form in model window uh, from inventory. Uh, it's the same form. So let's uh, uh, let's uh, put there some information, uh, some barcode, uh, uh, material type, uh, it, it, it's required field. So basically just uh, we have another required field. We can leave some note. Uh, uh, and press create item button. Uh, so let's save this. Uh, chicken piece. We have two of them. Uh, we can select them one by one or select all and press chicken. So review uh, chicken details. Uh, here we have location, uh, barcode. Uh, uh, barcode could be changed. Uh, we can press chicken and uh, we end up in chicken history uh, screen. Looking at our checked in pieces. Uh, basically, uh, from here, uh, if uh, some of item was checked in by error, by mistake, we can remove it from here. Uh, and uh, uh, it will appear on in chicken items um, uh, list. So for uh, inventory uh, integration, we can go to inventory list and uh, search uh, for our uh, item. It it's, uh, shows us uh, instance and uh, uh, in the uh, main library, we checked in one, uh, uh, we created item while uh, checking in. Uh, here, uh, here's our item. Uh, I think, I think uh, that's uh, uh, the status is on order since uh, we removed it from uh, check-in history. Uh, for more check-in functionality. We can go to another PO line. Uh, it's, it has PMX uh, format. So uh, it, it means uh, some physical and some electronic uh, items uh, included. So we can go to check in and on that piece, uh, user should specify a piece format uh, to distinguish. Uh, uh, Yep. And if uh, he, um, he specified uh, electronic, uh, we still have no, he can specify location, but he's not required to. Uh, but in case of physical, uh, he should specify location and uh, add item function is available. But uh, of course uh, he can just save the item. Uh, also, to sh for full presentation, uh, we can uh, check in items right from model window of phase and piece. Uh, so we end up in history with one checked in item. Uh, basically, that's it uh, for check in. Uh,
maybe you have questions or someone wants to add something. Thank you. That looks great. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Thunderjet. Um, Foleyjet is up next, and Anne Marie was going to kick it off. Are you there, Anne Marie? Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute. It's my okay. never ending problem. All right. So um, for Folajet, a lot of our Q2 work is going to be back end work, um, getting source record storage, where the mark records live, connected up to inventory, and influencing the instances that are in inventory, and then later connecting up with MarkCat. Um, but we also have uh, kind of continuing work on the data import UI going on as well. Um, but um, super important that we get a lot of the infrastructure in place in Q2. So on the UI side, um, Sasha Yohorov is going to demonstrate the next piece of our data import UI, which is the job profiles. And the job profiles are the collection of matches and actions and data mappings that a user wants to apply to a file that they're importing. So for example, I might have a file of mark cataloging records. I want to match on a purchase order line number and then update the related instances, holdings, and items with data that's in that mark record. So that collection of the match the actions I want to take and the mappings that I need to use will make up the job profile. So we're going to start with the job profiles and then we're going to move on to the UI for the matching action and data mapping profiles. So that's what Sasha is going to demo. And then Kate Senchenko uh, is going to demo some of the important back end work that's going on. So loading a mark record and using the existing pretty old at this point default mark mappings to take the data and turn it into an instance and in inventory and then having that mark uh, record create that instance and in inventory and be linked to it. We're going to be refining a lot of that work. We, we need to do work with UUIDs and uh, regular IDs and updating buttons and updating the mappings but getting the connection in place was the first piece. So Sasha and then Kate. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Hello, guys. Um, so hope I, uh, you can see my screen. Looks good. Uh, great, thanks. So we are on the job profile setting page of data import module. Uh, here we can see the list of uh, all job profiles available. Uh, by default, it's sorted uh, by name in alphabetical order, but we also have all different kinds of uh, sortings here. Um, we also can uh, search here. And when we search uh, the search string, uh, is uh, highlighted uh, in the results. Um, so, uh, we also have uh, details pane with all kinds of different information. Uh, summary pane, overview pane is blank for now, but it will be developed in the future. And uh, jobs using this profile uh, shows the latest uh, job executions uh, for this uh, particular job profile uh, and uh, it is sorted in reverse chronological order which means the most recent are on top. Um, we also can create uh, new job profiles. Let me demonstrate it. save and it's here and we can also 
edit it. And it works. So um, I believe that's it. Uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask. Thank you. Great, thank you. Looks good. I guess Kate is next. Yes, hello everyone. Hello. I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so I would like to demonstrate the way uh, we uh, parse Mark records and then map them into instances and store in uh, inventory storage. But before I upload the Mark file, I would like to go to Postman and check how many instances are already stored in the inventory. So uh, right now there are 219 instances and I would also see how many records. So we have 185 source records in source record storage. So I will go back to our application and right now I would choose a mark file and now the file is uploaded but to uh, trigger the actual processing of the records I would uh, have to use Postman again because we don't have a UI for this part yet. So I will copy the ID of upload definition and send a request to our module to start processing. Uh, here I would need to specify the upload definition as well. So I will just go and get it to my ID. <coughs> it contains uh, uh, all the information about the file. I copy and paste it into this request and send. So we receive a 204 uh, response, which is okay, because uh, the actual processing of the file happens in the background. Uh, right now, those uh, mark records should be parsed, mapped to instances, and stored in source record storage. As we see, uh, we have additional 62 records. And in uh, inventory storage as well, so yeah, we have them there. Um, I also can filter our source um, records to extract um, the records that we just parsed. Here we go, those 62. And uh, those are the parsed mark records. And if I scroll down and find the 245 field, which should be uh, the title of the instance, I copy it and go back to our application, to the inventory. And search. So here we go, we have this instance in here. Um, so I would also like to mention that uh, the functionality that maps uh, the mark records to instance records, we borrow from uh, Mod Data Loader. And as Anne-Marie said, we used pretty old mappings, so it will probably change in the future. But for now, this works uh, in this way. And I believe that's it that I wanted to share. Um, do you have any questions? Looks great, Kate. Thank you. It's an important milestone, that source record storage. Thank you. Okay, and um, next we have Vega with Ole.
Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. I, I would like you to show uh, how request related notices are sent in Folio system. So uh, let's create um, uh, first type of request. It's a page request. Uh, enter a barcode here. We see that the item is available, and I have prepared two users with different emails. Uh, barcode of first users is one, and second users is two. Uh, so let's create the request, uh, and now we are expecting to get uh, page request confirmation. That notice. Uh, now then, uh, let's uh, check in given item. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, we get a message uh, that item is ready for pickup. It's a uh, uh, second type of notice, available notice. Um, uh, then uh, let's check out this item. Mm -hmm. And now item is checked out and uh, we get a checkout receipt. Mm -hmm. And uh, next type of request is a uh, hold request. Um, let's create a hold request uh, for given item by second user. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, we got a uh, hold request confirmation. And uh, uh, let's uh, check in this item. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, we should get uh, notice that uh, item is ready for pickup. Mm -hmm. So let's check out that. Mm -hmm. And uh, now item is checked out by second users. So. Um, and then uh, let's uh, try to create uh, next time of request is recall request. Enter item barcode, and, uh, all. And now a uh, recall request is created uh, for the first user. Uh, the user get uh, request confirmation uh, and uh, the user who has uh, the item at the moment uh, should get a recall notification. Uh, and uh, the last type of uh, request related notice is uh, request cancellation. Uh, let's cancel our last request. Mm -hmm. And now we get request cancellation notice. So I think that's all I would like to show. Uh, thank you for the attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Wow, that's amazing. You guys have made really good progress. That's that so looks exciting. great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, okay, next we have at cult Tiziana. Okay, hello. Uh, um, okay, I will share my screen. Okay. Okay, I want just to update uh, uh, about uh, what we are doing now. We are trying to stabilize our uh, uh, application and uh, to to extend for some function. Uh, in this moment, we are working on some specific function that we uh, define with the group. And uh, one of these function is the ability to edit to edit a specific tag. Uh, so uh, I try here, for example, to edit this tag with at cult and subfield B beta, for example. 
And uh, I, we are working on this panel that is the action panel to include a shortcut. Uh, that, that is uh, something uh, useful to make uh, easier the cataloging workflow. And for example, you can include uh, a new field uh, above or below. And uh, for example, you can include uh, a tag uh, 300. And uh, okay, just to give you a little example, save. And with this function, uh, we can uh, duplicate the fields, for example. So we can have something like here. And uh, for example, save. And uh, you can uh, uh, again, or you can also add a new uh, tag using a command such as enter. So to simplify, so I add a new tag as a general note one, save, and duplicate the field. Save again. Okay, and so uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, we are working, uh, but uh, I have not just now an example because we are still working on it in uh, duplicated uh, a record and so including a new ID and uh, clicking on du duplicate. I cannot show you this because it's not still present in this test version, but is still in development environment. Uh, so just a brief, brief uh, uh, update about our work. I don't know, Annalisa, if you like to show something, if you think to show something different. No, I think that uh, for the moment uh, it's um, it's enough because uh, many functions are uh, under development. So um, I think uh, that uh, during uh, the next uh, sprint review we can uh, show the edit of uh, fixed field and uh, other function, for example, the duplicate record uh, that we can finish uh, and uh, yes. display it. So it's enough. Yes. It's enough, Kate, to us. Okay, that's great. Thank you for the, the update. However brief, it looks really good. Are there any questions for Tiziana? So I, I guess I have one is, do we know when we'll start to see MarkCat in like folio testing, folio snapshot? <laughs> Some people love it. <laughs> and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> I, I know we're all eager to get our hands on it. No, yes, Anne Marie, we are uh, um, we are trying to work with uh, some EBSCO people uh, to to optimize uh, the version, and uh, so uh, um, he's re uh, he's doing uh, a code review so that we are uh, sure that our code is stable and uh, correct. And uh, we, we, will, we need to finish this activity within May. So I suppose that at the end of this code review, we will be able to port this version, to froze this version and to, um, to publish on folio side for all uh, the community. That'll be great. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. All right, great, thank you. Um, I have ERM subgroup developers up next with Owen. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. We can. Let's just find the right window to share. may have too many windows open. All right. Um, okay, can you see a 
folio instance? Yes. Great. Okay, so um, what I want to mainly demonstrate today is uh, the integration between the agreements app and the e-holdings app. Um, and so this has been work that we've done, not just the ERM uh, development team, but also the e-holdings development team uh, working together. So uh, it's not, I'm not just presenting my team's work here, but a combination. So um, the way that um, agreements was originally uh, designed to work was it has a kind of built in what we call knowledge base, which is a list of all the electronic resources that can be made part of an agreement. And those electronic resources can, the, the details of those were in this electronic resources tab here, and that would list all the electronic resources available. Um, and they could get populated in a variety of ways, but essentially coming from um, a uh, somewhere that uh, had the details of uh, all the uh, resources and um, that was originally kind of um, fine for those who were using uh, sources that could populate into that but um, uh, there are other institutions who already have knowledge bases external to folio and want to continue to use those knowledge bases and uh, the most immediate example we have of that is people using the EBSCO knowledge base and um, and managing that via the eHoldings app, which uh, is an interface to the EBSCO knowledge base. And so um, what we wanted to do is make it possible for those people using eHoldings uh, and EKB, uh, the EBSCO knowledge base, to manage their resources to uh, be able to do that within uh, the agreements, uh, to, to still add those things to agreements so you, they could manage kind of things like uh, licenses that are attached to them or uh, connections to the right organizations uh, and renewals and all of that kind of thing that kind of tends to kind of hang around e-resources as part of the, the way that libraries negotiate access and pay for access and uh, subscribe to those resources. So um, we've done a few things to enable this. Um, so firstly, um, we've added a, a setting so that um, if um, uh, if you are not using the um, the kind of built-in knowledge base, that you can hide all the uh, all of that and the related functionality. So um, if I just set that now, if I go back to ERM, um, now we don't see the holdings tab. Uh, sorry, the resources tab here. So we we're, we're not um, using that internal knowledge base any longer. Um, and if I want to, uh, if I look at eHoldings um, and do a search for, for a package like Academic Search Complete, um, then um, from here, this is looking at the, the resource in the EBSCO knowledge base. And the eHoldings team have now added an agreements panel here. And I can either add this to an existing agreement or create a new agreement. Um, from here so if I click new I get taken to the agreements app again um, I can create a, uh, an agreement for this um, with all the usual agreement functionality so um, this is no different uh, really I can add things like internal contacts um, so that's people in the library who I might need to talk to about this agreement. They might have negotiated it or signed the contract, whatever. Um, and in the agreement lines, I should be able to see, that's worrying. I should be able to see the, um, the academic search uh, premier um, resource. Uh, let's see if this works. That didn't look good. Um, no. Uh, here's what I made earlier. Um, so I don't know why that didn't work just now, but uh, you can see I did this earlier with this agreement. This is the agreement line. So that's the, the resources, a list of the resources in here um, that um, I've got. And if I click on that, this is, a, um, this is the resource from the eHoldings and that takes me to the eHoldings record for that. So 
um, while I'm managing the agreement here, um, the resource itself is managed over an e-holding so I can activate or deactivate it or uh, set custom coverage. All the things I can do in e-holdings, they remain true and remain completely controlled by e-holdings, but I can add that to an agreement and then um, I can link um, license and business terms to this so I can set um, license terms about who can access it under what circumstances and that's all part of the agreements app and that uh, continues to kind of work um, as uh, as the agreements app did previously so um, that's the uh, uh, main uh, thing I wanted to demonstrate and as I say not uh, just something that we've been working on by ourselves but um, something that we've been uh, working on with the e-holdings team as well and has come out of quite a lot of work and planning um, from the end of last year uh, that has brought us to to be able to deliver that uh, in uh, in this sprint in the last sprint shall I say um, that's probably uh, the basics I, I, the, uh, of what I can show you uh, which seems like simple for something that actually was quite a lot of hard work but um, are there any questions on that? Or if Khalil is on the call or anyone from that team, uh, any comments from them on the development? I guess not. It's really exciting, Ellen. I know it was a lot of hard work getting here and it's a really great solution to make this agreements work both with the internal and external knowledge bases. It looks great. Yeah, and, and obviously if there are, you know, if eHoldings in the future starts to work with other knowledge bases apart from EKB, that will just then be, you know, um, done in the same way. So we, you know, this, this extends agreements, I think, in a really powerful way, depending on how people want to manage those knowledge bases of electronic resource information going forward. Yeah, definitely a great job with working with Owen and, and Jag and Steve and Mark and Yuri, uh, Igor and Carol and Sobo on this effort. Great job. Yeah, thanks, Kalina. All right. Thanks, Owen. Uh, okay, so core functional is next. And Zach, you're first. All right. Figure out the right. screen to share here. All right, so I've got a few things related to requests and then a few things related to locations. I'll start with requests. Um, so what I'm going to start with here is just uh, checking out an item. Oh, that's the item barcode. Checking out an item to a patron and um, generating a request on it. Um, we'll show that you can no longer put a request on an item that you have checked out. Just some back end work that was done, but we're actually now reflecting that correctly in the front end. All right, so we've got that checked out. Um, we'll go into the, uh, actually I'm looking at requests here. So we'll create a new request for that same item with that same user. And if we try to create the new request, oh, that's a nice service point here. If I try to create a new request here, we'll see that the requester currently has the item on loan, so you can't do that. Um, so let's create a request for a second user. That request will now go through. All right, so we have an open request for that. So let's go back into users and we'll try to renew that. Um, let's see your open loan. And here. All right, so we can successfully renew that. Um, if instead we put up a recall request, the renewal will be denied. So let's create another request. Same barcode. I'm going to change the type to recall here.
Oh, I gotta close my first request. All right, now I'll create the recall request. All right, now we have a recall request in place. And if we go back into users and try to renew this, it should fail. Um, so a couple of things here. One is it fails, which is some nice work done by the backend folks. And then the second is that we're correctly showing the error message here on the, um, the renewal confirmation, or in this case, the renewal denied screen. Previously, we printed up uh, the, the item wasn't renewed, um, but we're not correctly showing uh, the message about why the renewal was denied. So that is in place now, thanks to some good work done by the backend team. The other thing I wanted to demonstrate today is some fixes that we've made to locations. I'm going to show that from my local machine, which normally we wouldn't do, but I just didn't want to overload uh, our test environments by creating hundreds and hundreds of locations. Um, so I'm going to just demonstrate that on the local machine where I wasn't worried about <laughs> wrecking my own development environment. So we had um, problems showing more than, I think, 40 locations. Uh, all the way across Folio in different places in the organization settings page. And then it would also show up in the inventory page, both on filters and when trying to set the item, uh, set the location for an item. So I'll show here, um, I've uploaded the data for Texas A&M. Uh, so if we go into the organization and look at their locations, you can now filter down through here and see that um, we have all the locations that are supposed to be affiliated with uh, any given place. Similarly, if we look in inventory, it used to be that on this menu here, you wouldn't see all available locations. <laughs> they aren't all showing up now here. And if we go in to look at an item record and we want to set its location, we can do that as well. Since I find locations, oh, I'm in holdings. Let's go to the uh, you can see here we can again get into all the different um, campuses and then all the locations show up here as well and we can you know filter this list as always. So that was just a bug where the location limit was uh, only 40 units and we've increased that to 1,000 across the board. So you can see all the locations <laughs> across all the applications now. That's it for me. Thanks, Jack. Sure thing. Looks good. Um, okay, so next um, Emma was going to demo check-in, I think. You on, Emma? Yep, i um, sharing my screen now. All right, um, so I'm demoing some work that Aditya did before moving to ERM around um, check-in notes and check-out notes. Um, so got the item here. So the check-in or the check-out note, I should say, had already been working here. But what's new is that now, in case I close that so quickly that I didn't even read it, as was certainly the case right now, I can go here and review the check-out notes to make sure that I followed any instructions. Um, when loading this item to this patron. And if I am checking in the check-in notes, so this now displays, and I'll say, all right, I know enough to return the ID to the patron now, confirm that the item is checked in, and similar behavior where um, I can view the check-in note um, in case I forget what it said. And that's pretty much it, but this will really help um, if the notes are a little bit more specialized to help um, staff get their workflows done. So thank you to Aditya for working on this. Thanks, Emma. All right, and Mark Johnson volunteered last minute to try to demo something. Are you up for it, Mark? I will try. 
Um, All right. Can everybody hear me, which is the first thing. You can hear me then, Kate, that's good. I can, yeah. Brilliant, okay, I will try. Um, apologies to all, uh, this has been me putting it together pretty much right at the last minute. Um, and it's been a long time since I, um, since I demoed, so I'm not entirely sure everything's working. Can people see my screen? Which is the first question. Yes, we can. Good. Okay, excellent. So um, I set up a few things. I'm going to demo two stories, one of which is that um, we want to stop somebody from being able to request an item that they've already requested. So they can only make a request for an item once. Um, this was to prevent somebody from being able to effectively just continue recalling something so they basically they always have it, um, which is a little cheeky, but you know we, we, we figured we'd stop that. So. Um, I've got my favorite item um, from an Al Gore book um, and a couple of requests that are already created for this. Um, one by um, Claude Cronin and one by Doug Denisic. And I'm going to try and create a new request for one of those users for the same item. And it should tell me that I can't. So I know this isn't very sophisticated, but I'm just wandering around copying and pasting stuff, but hopefully that's okay. Um, right, so that is the same item. We will take the user, barcode. And check that. And then hopefully when I say new request, it pops up and says, this requester has already got an open request for this item, and therefore you can't, and rejects the request from being created. So that's the first story. Um, that looks relatively simple. Um, and uh, so uh, you can only have one open request. Once a request is closed, um, then you can create a new request. Otherwise, that would, you wouldn't be able to do it at all. Um, I won't demo that because I'm using the same item to demo the other work that was done, and I don't want to um, trash the test, the demo data that I've got together. Okay, so what we can see here is that there are already two recalls um, for this item placed uh, for Al Gore, and this item is already checked out to a different user. It is checked out to, hopefully, let's just check. It is checked out already um, because it has to be checked out previously in order for it to be, um, in order for a recall request to be placed. So um, I've changed the loan policy for this setting to state that when there is a um, recall request present, um, the loan period is two weeks rather than one month. The normal loan period would be a one month rolling period. So we did this work recently to, to make it so that when you create the request, it changes the due date. This piece of work also does that when we, when we um, check out an item. To do that, we have to have two requests in place because the checkout, you can only check out an item to the person who has next requested it. That means that the first request has to be, is effectively um, partially fulfilled when they check it out. So let me check this in so that it, should go should be ready for the next person to check in i won't print this print slip okay so this should now be a waiting pick it should now be ready and awaiting pick up by for the um for the first requester which is um doug denisic we should we can check that by this yeah so we now have the top request that is now awaiting pickup so what should happen is when um, Doug turns up to check it out for himself, um, because uh, Cloud Cronin has also requested it, that should only they should only he should only get a Doug should only get um, a two week loan rather than a one month loan. So let's just confirm that. I go to checkout and Doug. Check Doug's barcode. That's good. That means that at least it reminds me that it's awaiting somebody he has got this to pick up. And do this. 
and you should be able to see them. Hang on. Yes, you should be able to see the, on here that the, the due date for this loan is the 7th of May um, instead of what would be the 23rd of May for a one month renewal. Um, so it took me a little bit of time because I, I find it hard to parse American dates because I'm, I'm used to British dates. So apologies for that delay. Um, that's it. That was a bit rough and ready. If anybody's got any questions, please ask. Kate, was that, that, was was that you just... No, ready? that was perfect, Mark. It made perfect sense to me. I'm not sure if everybody else followed because it is rather complex logic, but it looks yeah. great to me. Are there questions? Yeah. I, I mean, I can explain the logic further if anybody does, if anybody didn't follow, if that would help. I think we're all right. It, it seemed okay. fine for somebody who was a circ librarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, that's the audience of this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. No worries. Okay. All right, um, great. So we are done with the demos and um, up next is Anton with an update on QA. Uh, hello everyone, just give me a second to share my, my screen. Um, okay, can you see my quality dashboard wiki page yep yep okay i'll be quick just to uh, highlight few changes on the on the dashboard um well first first one is that i changed the way we report on coverage in the dashboard so we show consecutive progress of the coverage growth for five sprints and during spring 61, we actually made a great progress and we reached the 80% uh, uh, coverage for UI requests, as well as we reached uh, over 80% for UI orders. So the top section of, the, uh, of this report just covering UI modules. And if you see a green checkpoint, that means we are compliant if it's a yellow, exclamation triangle then it's work in process and where it's a red square uh, it means we haven't started yet so and all the rest of the modules not core modules they are aggregated at the bottom and most of them are having pretty good numbers and we just got a couple more modules like ui ERM usage and ui organizations uh, started reporting coverage this week in uh, SonarCube, so that's great. So all I have to say is, uh, guys, if you own a module and you don't see your results in here, then I encourage you to start writing big tests um, and integrate it into the CI/CD pipeline so we can start reporting uh, reporting in it. If you have any, uh, if you need any help, then please please reach out. I will uh, figure out how to help you, how to get you going. We just had a training for UNAM team where uh, we did, um, Victor uh, did a great job presenting as well as creating a sample big test for them right within the code that they, uh, they're working on. So if you need any help, just please reach out and uh, I'll help you to get, get things going. Otherwise, I would be very excited if I see your module start popping up in this report. Moving on to the bugs, we are actually making pretty good progress and you see that we're closing bugs, more bugs than we are opening and our bug count is shrinking. It's actually now 471 and it was over 500 just a couple of sprints ago. So again, uh, if you schedule certain portion of your sprint for the bug fixing and keep killing bugs that would be would be great we want to keep it low we want to keep it in a single digit and we, we don't want to let it run away like um, uh, in the um, in a, a high digit specifically for some um, uh, modules that have a lot of history so it's kind of hard to get back to the single digits but I have to admit that UI users and inventory are making great progress. 
their bug count is shrinking and it's a great news as well. So um, that being said, that's uh, kind of pretty much all the highlights that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, the dashboard is available, it's updated uh, every sprint. Uh, so I know I'm the last person that stands between you and lunch or you and dinner. So if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them as soon as I can. Thanks, Anton. That's good news. We're trending in the right direction. Yes. All right. Um, let's see. That pretty much wraps things up. Let me just pull up the slides one more time. <clears throat> And see what we've got here. So um, each of the teams, well, I, okay. So sprint 62 and 63, they'll both be two week sprints. We will reconvene for a sprint review after May 17th. And again, the interim release is May 17th. And then each of the uh, teams have added their plans for the coming sprints, just high level, um, you know, what's in the backlog for the next couple sprints. So you can take a look at those if you're interested. And it uh, looks like we're actually done early. Are there any questions or other things people would like to discuss while we're all together? All right, sounds like uh, we can have our time back. Thank you so much, everyone. We will get the recording and the uh, deck out um, shortly.